Morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see you this morning. I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Same, uh, same passage we were considering for our children's story this morning. Exodus chapter 20, which is where we find those famous Ten Commandments. How many are in the Ten Commandments? Right. Okay, just checking if the adults had caught on to that. Right. Okay, so the Ten Commandments, they start in Exodus chapter 20, and we'll, we'll be working our way through them uh, very quickly this morning as it will lead into our, uh, our communion service. Exodus chapter 20 from verse 1, and it starts like this. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of of bondage. The first thing I want us to note about the Ten Commandments is, is that, that they're, they're enveloped, enveloped with, with the concept, concept of grace and, and relationship. You know, too many people down through the ages have interpreted these commandments in a merely behavioral, external, checklist sort of a way, a, a, a code of behaviors that God expected His people to live up to. And that was the condition of life. In fact, the way the commandments begin is not with verse 3. When God begins speaking the commandments, He begins by reminding them of two things. Number one, I am the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am the one that has prepared the way for freedom. I am the one who has delivered you miraculously with ten plagues and, and, and incredible interventions. I've sustained your life all because of my goodness and my kindness. And I did all of that before having this conversation. I'm about to have with you now. Grace always precedes obedience. Grace always, the kindness is always the initiative of God way before He has any conversation with us about what He expects of us. We are always responding to a God who first reaches out to us. He always takes the first step and then invites us to join Him in the rest of the journey. So the first thing I want you to note about the commandments is they begin with a reminder of the graciousness, the goodness, the kindness, the mercy of God, number one. Number two, I want you to notice in your Bibles in verse two that it says, I am the Lord your God. In some of your Bibles, that word Lord is in small little capital letters. Is that right? And whenever you find that in your Bibles, Lord, L-O-R-D, in little capital letters, it's, it's, a, it's what's actually there in the Hebrew is the personal covenantal name of God. In other words, the, what the, in technical language is called the tetragrammaton, the four, fi, the four little letters, Y-H-W-H, translated into English as Jehovah. Does that make sense to you? So he says, before I even begin talking to you about the journey I want you to embark on, remember the graciousness, the kindness, the mercy, the gentleness, the initiative that I've taken to reach out to you. And remember the one who's speaking to you is the personal God, the one who speaks to you, as it were, on a first name basis. My name is Jehovah, and that name is always characterized by the God of promise. Whenever you see that name, it's a reference to the God who makes promise and keeps promise, the God of covenant, the God who enters into agreement with humanity based on His grace and His kindness and His goodness. I am the covenant-keeping God, the one that promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the one that has fulfilled that for you people. I have delivered you. I've been kind to you. I am the personal God, Jehovah, my first name, promise-keeping, promise-making God. Which is interesting because when you read it that way, it changes the whole atmosphere of the Ten Commandments. Because suddenly the Ten Commandments are not merely things you have to do to please God, but they are things that God is promising to do in you. Does that make sense? I am the covenant-keeping God, and the discussion I'm about to have with you, these commandments I'm about to deliver to you, are not just a one-sided what I want you to do. These are the things that I want to see accomplished in your life. I have delivered you physically, and I will deliver you relationally. I will deliver you spiritually. I will deliver you morally. I will deliver you uh, behaviorally. I am the God who, in the same way that I've delivered you from your enemies, whom you had no hope of ever escaping from, I am about to do something amazing in your individual, personal lives. The way you live in community with others, the way you relate to me, I'm about, if you agree to this, I'm about to radically change and transform you. You see, it was less about what they would do and more about what God was 
promising to do. They are commandments of promise. They are prophetic utterances by the God who delivers his people as to what will happen in their lives if they will let him live in them and through them, if they will let him deliver them. Does that make sense to you? When you read the commandments through those eyes, they become amazing. They become something you anticipate. They become something that is good. They become something that are, is about grace and redemption. They become something which is good news. They become something which is about healing and restoring relationships. Does this make sense to you? Verse 3 is where he begins telling them what it looks like to be in healthy relationship. First with himself, the first four are, are of the relationship between God and man, that covenant relationship between the personal God who reaches out to humanity. This is how you grow in relationship with me. This is what it looks like to be, to be walking faithfully in covenant with me. First one, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, that's almost just plain logical. After God has redeemed you, after he has set you free, after he has proved to be the most important figure in your life, it only makes sense that he will always be prioritized at the top of any relationship hierarchy you have in your life. Before your relationship with your parents, before your relationship with your children, before your relationship with objects and things, before your relationship with yourself, in this world where we're interconnected inevitably in relationships, the thing that God wants to do is restore the correct hierarchy of relationship. It's not that the things we have relationship with are always necessarily wrong. It's that our temptation is to prioritize things above and ahead of God. Good things, normal things, relationships with people, relationships with ourselves, relationship with objects in the world. We tend to want to reorganize that hierarchy. That is the essence of sin. All transgression flows out of an incorrect prioritization of relationships. You see, when I love objects more than people, I will use and abuse people to get what I want, or I will discard people because they're irrelevant to get, getting me what I want. I, I, will even, I will even pray to God in ways that is more about Him serving what I really want out of life than it is about me communing with God. Have no other gods before me is a call to relational restoration, a priority statement. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. He says, he says, when you get the first one wrong, it is very easy to start to make false gods, to make an external representation of what has already happened on the internal. An incorrect relational priority turns me towards and to live out the externals in inappropriate ways. He says, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to accept that my presence in your life is far greater than you can understand. There is much you can know about me. I have revealed myself as the God of redemption, the God of love. You know enough about me to have a heartfelt relationship with me. And at the same time, I want you to live in humility before me, not thinking that you can understand or picture or grasp the fullness of who I am. So when you think you're honoring me by making some physical representation of me, you are actually insulting me. You are actually reducing me to what you can imagine. You're reducing me to, to what your mind can comprehend. You're taking away from me, even if you believe it's to honor me, you're taking away from the greatness and the grandeur of who I am. You limit yourself in comprehending me because you have now created me in your image. The creation order is that we are created in his image, and the second commandment forbids that we should try to create him in our image according to what we can imagine especially a corrupt and fallen imagination which is prone to distort, not just limit, but actually distort the, the, the greatness and the glory of who God really is. He says, let me be the invisible God. Let me be the great and wonderful God. Don't try to limit me. It will hurt you. It will hurt 
the relationship between us. And unfortunately, in many a Christian church today, even this very commandment is forgotten. Number three, God says in verse seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You must understand that that has, that has the sound of family. That has the sound of relationship. Because just like you live in relationship to your children and how they act reflects upon you as a parent, right? The, your family name. Have you ever had those kind of discussions with your children? Did your parents ever have those kind of discussions with you? That, that as we live in family with one another and are called by a certain name together, how the one acts or reacts in public and with other people has a reflection on the rest of the family. Is that true? Yes, right? And God says, I want my name to be cherished by you. I want my name to be reverenced by you. I want this name, this name by which you are calling, this name that you're invited to take upon your lips and upon your life, this name that makes us family, I want that name to mean something to you. And so when you take that name and you use it in flippant and careless manner, when you use it as expressions of surprise or rage or anger or, 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 or joke or just carelessly, that brings that name down. It, it, it does something inside of your own head and your own mind. It, it takes this beautiful thing that God is, that name that is supposed to remind you of the covenant keeping, the redeeming, the saving God, and it makes him the butt of the joke. It insults him. And by the way, you don't even have to say the whole expression, oh my God, right? You can just type it on Facebook, OMG. It is the same thing. Right? You, you, you don't have to use the full name of God. You can truncate or use euphemisms for the name of God. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know what a euphemism is, right? Instead of saying, he died, we say, he passed away. We say the truth, but we try to say it in a softer way. Instead of taking the title of Christ or Jesus Christ, the name and the title, as a swear word in its fullness when I kick my foot on the stone or whatever I might do, I could say things like, crikey. Or gosh, which is a truncation, a euphemism of God. By the way, I don't make this stuff up. You can actually look those words up. And when you look them up, they will tell you they're euphemisms. They're, they're watered down versions of the name of God. There are many ways in which we take the name of God. Here's one I hear often. The word holy, which is attached to the person and the presence of God, right? Whenever you, whenever you think of the word holy, you think of the holy Sabbath day. You think of the holy God. The word holy always in Scripture represents the presence, the very, the very essence of God. Nothing is holy in and of itself. It is only holy because God adopts it into His presence and uses it for His purpose. When you attach the word holy to various other expressions, what are you doing? You're taking the holiness of God and reducing it to a, an insult or an expression or a surprise. Why do we do that? Here's a question for you. Have you ever wondered how to know for sure that you're serving the true God? Here's a very simple way. The third commandment. Because out of all the plethora of gods out there, all the options of the, the Hindu and the Buddhist and the, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, and, and the Islamic and whatever other gods out there there are, have you noticed that in this world, no matter where you are, there is only one name that Satan sees fit to bring low? There is only one God that Satan sees fit, whether it's on television or anywhere else, to make a mockery of his name. And that tells me, that tells me that there is only one name he truly fears. Only one name he wants us to think of in cheap and ordinary terms because it is only that name that will save and redeem. I don't wor worry about bringing the name low of enemies I'm not afraid of. <laughs> Does that make sense? It is the ones who strike fear into my heart that I want to malign and bring low. So next time you hear those expressions, hear the great controversy and make sure that you stand on the right side of the great controversy. The fourth one, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know what I call that? Date night with God. <laughs> That's what that's about. 
Special time, uninterrupted, letting nothing interfere. There's, the, 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 there's, no, there's no sports, there's no work, there's no, there's no auctioning, there's no business, there's no, there's no commerce, there's no, there's no... All of that stuff that fills our time, that occupies our time, there's the, the secular recreations, the, the computer games, and, the, and, 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 the, and, the, and whatever it is, you, just, you, you name it. You fill in the blank for you, the thing that you're tempted to search after, things that are not necessarily bad at other times of the week, but God calls us. It would be like, it would be like going on a date with your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your husband, and you're sitting there at that candlelit table. Everything's perfect, but every five minutes you're taking out this little thing called your phone just to check what messages are coming in while your love is sitting across on the other side. You see, nothing wrong with that. It's just not really the appropriate time right now to be doing that. Or, yes, honey, you just carry on talking about, about those deep things on your heart. I've just, I've just really got to check in with, that, uh, with that, uh, that, that office issue of mine. I'm listening, I'm listening, but I, you get what I'm saying. It's a distraction, and it says, my heart is elsewhere. I am physically present, but my mind and my heart is somewhere else. Does that make sense to you? All of these things, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is date night with God. Sorry, it says, is the, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, your strangers within your gates. In six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Do you, do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, I want you to imitate me. I want you to go with me on this. I worked for six. I rested on the seventh. You know what that meant, right? He rested on the seventh. That means he didn't rush off to another building project. He didn't go to some far place in the universe. He rested on the seventh day because that was the goal of creation. The goal of creation wasn't humanity by itself on a beautiful planet. The goal was humanity on a beautiful planet in relationship to one another and in covenant with the promise-keeping God. The seventh day was a day when God rested and gave himself to humanity. That is the goal of human life. That is the only place where ultimate fulfillment takes place. That is what the seventh day is all about. God is very specific. He doesn't say the principle is one in seven. He doesn't say pick one. He says, honor me by letting, be, letting me be Lord of creation and Lord of the universe. Let me be the one who picks the date and the time. You come to that time. You honor me by recognizing my authority and my right as creator to pick the specific time. Then you imitate me. As I give myself to you, you give yourself to me and block out all that other stuff, good and right in its proper place, but just not appropriate in that moment of date night, looking through the candlelight, staring God in the eyes. He says, honor me, imitate me, and not just in recognizing the time and the place. But listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give the same privilege to everyone else under your jurisdiction. The created world, the animals, the people that you might employ, your family members, whoever is under your jurisdiction and your right to have authority over. He says, imitate me as I call you to freedom. You give freedom to them. How they use it is their business. If they choose to disregard it, that's on them. But let it never be said that because of some Sabbath keeper who made me work in his behalf, I couldn't honor the Sabbath day. Give the freedom to others that I call you to, to enter into. Then he shifts gears. He goes to the most significant human relationship, and that's the parent-child relationship. Verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. He says, listen, I'm going to make you a promise. I want to bless this earth with longevity. And in order for that to happen, I need you to honor father and mother. 
I need you to recognize them as God-given authority in your life. I need you, even when they are not honorable, even when they fail, I need you to honor them. Now, honoring them doesn't mean I'm a slave to their every whim when their every whim is fundamentally sinful and they're calling me to disobey the commandments of God and to dishonor my relationship to the Creator. Remember, thy relationship hierarchy always has God at the head of that relationship. In fact, many times I may honor my parents by calling them politely, gently, respectfully to a higher standard. There are many times when I might have to say no to my parents because I am honoring them and do not want to see them further degrade themselves or the family. There are ways in which I honor God and I honor my parents. There are ways in which I say to them, come up higher when they are not when they are not acting honorably or worthy of honor. But it is never done in a spirit of rebellion. It's never done in a spirit of opposition. It's never done in a spirit of self-seeking. I honor my father and my mother by respecting them, by reverencing them, by obeying them in all things reasonable, in all things godly. I honor my parents. I am grateful to my parents, and that honors them for the sacrifices that they have made. I honor them when I thank them. I honor them when I respect and reverence them. I honor them by taking care of them in their old age and being there for them. I honor them by recognizing them as a gift from the Almighty, no matter how old or how young I am or they are. Number six, you shall not murder it's written in a very specific way. You shall not murder, which, which, which is about premeditation. And this is why Jesus later on in the New Testament comes along and says, You've heard it said, Thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, you hate your brother in your heart and you have committed murder, right? He goes, he goes way down deep. He says, just because you haven't lived out the desire of your heart doesn't mean you haven't transgressed. You haven't obliterated relationship in your heart and in your mind. He says, he says listen, the, 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 the issue of the commandments flow out of the state of one's heart, relationship to God and relationship to humanity. I can smile at someone externally because I fear the results or I respect my own name enough, enough to not want to make a scene and make myself look foolish while in my heart I cherish hatred towards them. In the eyes of God... We are transgressors in that circumstance of this very commandment. I might use my lips to murder someone. I might not take a knife to their back or a gun to their head, but I might with my words and my lips assassinate their character, break them down, make them as if they were dead in the eyes of other people because of what they have done to me. There are many ways in which you and I might seek to murder someone that doesn't involve a physical act. Jesus says, I want you to respect life. Even life which you believe is a waste of space. Even life which you believe is unworthy of being alive. I want you to respect that life, to reverence it, for only God has the right to take human life. You know why? Because human beings were not placed in subjection to one another. The created world was given to humanity to rule over, right? The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the animals and all things. You and I have the right to make decisions about mercy and death and life in those circumstances. But human beings are created equal under God. And therefore, this thing we call mercy killing, I believe, would be covered by this thing called murder. Why? Because you and I are not over and above someone else. All human beings stand equal before God. Only God gets to make those decisions. You shall not commit adultery. You know that there's two commandments that come out of Eden, right? The first one is the Sabbath commandment. It was there before sin, before Adam Adam and Eve and the Jewish nation came about. Adam and Eve, of course, weren't Jews, right? They preceded the Jewish race by thousands of years. So there before sin, there is a Sabbath. Before, Before the Jewish nation, there is a Sabbath. And now that is confirmed in the fourth commandment. But there was something else given to them. One another, right? This thing called marriage, this thing called relational intimacy in the form of marriage. And the seventh commandment comes right out of Eden along with the Sabbath. It says, respect, reverence, 
take seriously the commitment to marriage. Save yourself before marriage for the one you will one day marry. Sometimes people think this only refers, this only governs me once I am married, right? Because adultery is when you take someone else to be your partner or to mess around with physically and sexually when you are married. So clearly before I'm married, this commandment has no bearing, right? The New, the New Testament has a word fornication. And fornication is is sexually playing up, if you like, before marriage. You might put it this way. Adultery covers sexual intimacy before marriage in that you are now cheating prophetically against the one you will one day marry, the one you will one day commit to, the one whom you should be saving yourself for, to give yourself to them in all purity as you would like them to do for you. You are now violating that future commitment today. Adultery covers a whole range of things from, from, well, put it this way, anything outside of a loving, trusting, genuine marital commitment, any sexual activity outside of that, whether it's just looking with your eyes, as Jesus implies, you look at a woman to lust after her, Jesus said, and you have committed adultery where? In your heart. Given the right circumstances and the right opportunity, that desire of your heart may manifest itself physically. But just because you haven't gotten there doesn't mean it's already not, not already happening inside of you. Whether it's the magazines you look at or the movies that you choose to watch, the graphic details that are contained in those things, taking pleasure in those things, letting your heart bind to those things, all of that would qualify here. Thinking of the opposite sex, or these days the same sex perhaps, simply seeing that person's body as an object to gratify my desire for pleasure would qualify under this thing called adultery. Jesus calls us here, God calls us here to respect and to reverence, to protect this thing called marriage, this relationship between one man and one woman for life. He goes on to say, you shall not steal. And by the way, if you commit adultery with someone, you have stolen somebody else's mother, somebody else's father, somebody else's husband, somebody else's wife. You have taken away from that family unit, that sacred thing, that trust, that, that, that intimacy for yourself in the moment, in the heat of passion, for your physical gratification. When you break one of these commandments, you will often find that you're breaking multiple of these commandments. And James has something to say about that, doesn't he, in the New Testament. You, when you break one of the laws of liberty, you're guilty of all, because all are underpinned by the purity of love, self-sacrificing, seeking the best and the blessing of others around me, first towards God, second towards others, and when I get that relationship priority all messed up and I seek myself first or others first before God or, or things, then I begin to transgress these commandments to obtain the desire of my heart. How do we steal we steal in many, many different ways. We steal people's reputation. There's that gossip thing again, right? We steal, we steal a position, a position or, or credibility from someone when we use their thoughts. Maybe I'm doing an academic paper at university and I just borrow other people's ideas and thoughts and give no credit for that, right? We call that, what's the fancy word for that? plagiarism, right? Yeah, we, we, we do things like that. Or maybe I steal someone else's intellectual property. We, we even have things called patent laws today to try and protect that kind of thing from happening. We think just because something's not physical, that if I take it or I borrow it, that's not stealing. We, 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 steal, we steal music and movies when we borrow these things from our friends and we haven't paid for them, right? Right? We are taking another person's livelihood. We're taking what God has blessed them with and appropriating it. But it's not physical, right? So it's not stealing. Or is it? There are ways in which we violate this commandment. He goes on to say, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Very interesting way of putting it. We translate it into, the, into you shall not lie, right? But you shall not bear false witness. You know what the idea is? Every word you speak is always relative to other people. When I speak something that is untrue, I am maligning the character of somebody else. Does that make sense to you? I'm representing 
a person in a certain light which may be true or not true. In fact, I could tell you the truth of my words and use the inflection and the tone of my voice and my body language to convey exactly the opposite. That would be bearing false witness, as in the case of sarcasm or irony, where I'm trying to, trying to deliberately steer someone away from the truth. So I say the right words, but I use my body language and my tone to misguide them. The intention is deception, is covered by this commandment. Telling half a story with the intent that that half a story would shade a situation in my favor. That would be covered by this commandment. Anything that involves the intent to deceive, particularly and especially when it reflects on other people. Again, a commandment that is about respecting the integrity of another person and building trust and positive relationship between one another. Have you noticed that every single one of these commandments are always lived out in community, in relationship with other people? These were not merely 10 checklist behaviors that God gave. He gave this that we would flourish in our relationships. He gave this that we would know him and that we would know one another, that we would be safe with one another, that we would be vulnerable with one another, knowing that I can trust you and you can trust me, knowing that whether it's my possessions or my reputation or my very life, whether it's my family, that you were going to honor me in all things and I was going to honor you in all things in the way that God honors us in all things. When you understand this and you read the New Testament where it says, sin is the transgression of the law, suddenly you realize sin is the many and varied ways in which I interject myself into this priority that God should occupy. Or when I interject other people into that priority place or things into that priority place. I realize that, that transgressing the moral law of God is not just an external behavioral thing. I realize that that flows out of a corrupt heart, a confused and a disoriented heart. And I realize the only way that like the Israelites of old, I could put up my hand and say, we will do all that the Lord has commanded is if I move by God's grace into a safe and healthy relationship with Him. There is no way, as much as I look at this and go, yes, Lord, that's what I want. That's what I would agree to. There is no ways I can keep these because all of the externals of life flow from the internal of the heart. And the internal of the heart is a corrupt and deceived stream, confused and disoriented. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, or your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. He calls us to live in a relationship orientation toward him and people of gratefulness and of contentment, to be happy with what we have and to be happy with the fact that we don't have all we would maybe like to have. He says, I want you to be able to rejoice with those who rejoice, with those who receive good gifts. I don't want you to be chasing after, wishing for, being jealous of, uh, being regretful towards God and, and other people. I don't want you to jeopardize relationships because you think he has a prettier wife or he has a nicer car or whatever the case may be, the thing that calls to your heart. He says, I want you to be able to rejoice with people, to be grateful for the way God blesses them. I want you to be attuned to the many thousands of ways in which God blesses you. The 10th commandment in the positive terms is all about recognizing the goodness of God and being grateful for that goodness, even if in some areas of life, he has been better to others in your estimation than he has been to you. Does that make sense to you? The 10th commandment is about approaching people and God open-handedly, not being someone who clings to things and objects and wants them for himself. I wonder if the solution of the 10th commandment would finish the gospel work. How so? Because if the 10th commandment were honored in the way that it should, we would be far more open-handed with the resources that God bestows upon us to bless His cause and to usher in the age of the kingdom. It would be less about us and our comforts and our luxuries and our toys and our things. And I speak to myself right now. It would be less about my selfishness and more about the orientation toward blessing and generosity. 
10 commandments, 10 ways in which God says, I want you to live out love in a real way, in relationship to people, in community. I want you to represent who I am. I want you to prioritize me, and I want you to bless people around you. I want you to live not for yourself, but for others. I want you to know that life is about community, people, relationships. That is what creation was about when I gave myself to you and made you in connection with everything and everyone else. And I said, be fruitful and multiply. Life is, this world is, this creation is, at its core, relational. It's not object-oriented. It's not task-oriented. It's not thing-oriented. It is relational at its core. And he says, you cannot violate any of these 10 commandments without jeopardizing your relationship to me and your relationship to others. And at the end of this, as you read this, maybe you're like me and you go, wow, that is, I've never seen that before. As someone who is naturally object and task oriented, for me to see that, it's like revelation. It's like, wow, that is amazing, God. And at the same time, I have that mixture of feeling that goes, oh, God, have mercy. Oh God, have mercy. Because I realize that in the midst of relationships, I am so often living for the wrong priorities. So often in my relationship with God and with people, living for the wrong priorities. No wonder transgression abounds in this the chief of sinners. And today, we have a unique opportunity because while we contemplate this and you shrink from it, you realize that the God who knows we are incapable of this has provided His sufficiency because He has lived this and He gives us this status as our own in Christ. You realize that this God stands before you today calling you to humility of soul, not like the Israelites in their shallowness of understanding and the pride of their own hearts going, yes, Lord, this we will do. But in humility of heart, we go, yes, Lord, that's what I want. But God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, selfish, disoriented, confused to the core. God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. God, I need your cleansing. I need you to wash me in that fountain at Calvary. I need you to cleanse me with your stream of righteousness. I need you to make me whole. I want your body. I want your blood, Jesus, to stand in my place. I accept your sacrifice for a sinner such as me. I invite you to pause for a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, today as we wash one another's feet, today as we eat of the bread, a symbol of your sacrifice, your body, as we drink of that red grape juice, a symbol of that spilled blood, we realize that it is because at our core we're confused and disoriented and we become relationship assassins. We are guilty of transgressing, not mere behaviors, but the very relational code of love that you've designed this universe to operate on. And I pray, Jesus, I pray, Jesus, that you would forgive us, that you would humble us, and that you would fill us with the joy of your acceptance, knowing that as we go through this enacted drama of eating the bread and of drinking the wine, Jesus Almighty, that we would know that we are cleansed and we are accepted by you, weak and fallen as we are, that we, your church, remain the apple of your eye. Thank you for, for demonstrating that kind of love commitment to us. And may it be seen in our love relationships with those whom we deem are not worthy of our time or our presence. May we love them, forgive them, the way you have loved us and forgiven us. 
Teach us to love the way that you love. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The men will adjourn to the hall where we will wash one another's feet before returning. And the ladies will be in the conference room just next door.